Hello, planet Earth, and I, we are of this planet, aren't we, Michael? Yes. I'm Tosh Berman. This is Tea with Tosh. My special guest is Michael Silverblatt of uh, Freeman and Sutton Public Relations, which makes you a public relation man. Um, usually I have on the show like artists and uh, poets, songwriters, you know, stuff like that. But this is the first time I had a public relation man on the show. Um, why are you in the show? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, Tosh, I started out by being a writer mm -hmm. and with a lot of seriousness, mm -hmm. too, and very confused about how does one go about continuing to be a writer mm -hmm. when there's no money coming in from writing. Mm. Um, I had had a couple of stories published with a co-writer, Polly Frost, in the Atlantic and with Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. And the question of what my future would be like, which seemed at that point to be wonderful but economically grim, mm -hmm. um, was pressing on me. One day I found myself involved with a benefit for the Royal Shakespeare Company. Mm -hmm. The Royal Shakespeare Company was doing a piece called Yearly Free. Mm -hmm. They were trying to raise money for AIDS and I was appointed as liaison mm -hmm. to the public relations company. Well, in the course of things, over years of freelancing and knowing mm -hmm. writers and painters and dancers and sculptors and artists and journalists, particularly journalists, I'd run into so many people that I got the production more publicity than the company that had been hired to publicize it. Mm -hmm. I said, aha, <laughs> I may have, if I hold my breath for uh -huh. a very long time and mm -hmm. I'm very careful, I may have a career here. Mm -hmm. This has been my greatest desire since the word go. I think since I was this high, mm -hmm. I've always wanted to wear a sport jacket every day. <laughs> <laughs> the art world was not facilitating this desire. And so when why, I... Why is it the artists don't wear sport jackets? I don't know. It's a regrettable lapse. Yeah. I think that there is such a um, premium placed mm -hmm. on being a rebellious spirit that no one's quite noticed that, at least for people like me, wearing a sport jacket is the best rebellion at all. It's like wearing a clown suit every single day. Absolutely. Um, and enjoying the formality of uh -huh. it, too. It's a great, you know, joy, as William Burroughs pointed out, mm -hmm. to feel completely costumed and to be absolutely anonymous. You know, it's funny because even uh, William Burroughs, the uh, the writer, uh, even when he's like in the middle of the jungle, uh, the Amazon, he shaved every day. He made yes. a big point of that to be always neat and proper. And looking. not even the alligators thought he was out of place. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, there's an earthquake here, I think. Oh my goodness, it is earthquake season, isn't it? <laughs> uh, this rather Magritte-like environment is falling on me. Um, something that we're quite used to in the public relations business. We call it crisis management. Oh yeah, but what is that then? Crisis management. You may have noticed of late that certain companies may have um, caused South American villages to disappear mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. This is not the best thing to happen for a company, mm -hmm. but it does happen from time to time. There are certain ways that public relations can address the press and thereby the nation to let everyone know that a company is willing to take responsibility for its actions mm -hmm. and to respond as quickly as possible, as effectively as possible, to minimize a disaster. Mm -hmm. Now, for instance, when Tylenol had their disastrous poisoning. And then it was a disaster, wasn't it? It, was, it could <laughs> have been a disaster uh -huh. for the company, and it was a tragedy mm -hmm. for consumers who yes. could not be protected. But the company did very well in letting people know that they were corporately responsible, mm -hmm. that they were taking the moves as quickly as possible mm -hmm. to minimize the possibilities mm -hmm. of poisoning and catastrophe. That is public relations at its direst. I am myself not involved in that kind of public relations. We're more involved at Freeman and Sutton with actors and producers mm -hmm. and um, celebrities, certain corporate accounts, mm -hmm. but in their most 
public aspect. Well, let me ask, back to the corporation thing, this is kind of interesting. How, how, how does someone deal with the uh, Jim Jones uh, massacre and the Kool-Aid uh, connection? How would the Kool-Aid <laughs> people deal with it? Yes. Um, I mean, there must have been like mass suicides in the main office at Madison <laughs> Avenue, I presume. That, in a certain way, what they teach you in public relations is that you do not, you do not avoid a subject. Mm -hmm. Rather, you bring the subject to a climax within a single news cycle. That is to say, you bring as many facts as are available mm -hmm. to bear within one news cycle, one week. If you do, if you bring all, your whole story into mm -hmm. place for the media and the interviewees, the interviewers, excuse me, the talk shows, mm -hmm. you will very likely, the news moves along, mm -hmm. have your whole story wrapped up within a single week mm -hmm. and people will think about something else. Mm -hmm. Now, the hard case, as long as there are new pieces that stays f freshly sore in mm -hmm. the public's mind. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that the Kool-Aid people would not want to do anything did about they, they, the, they, not that I know of. On the other hand, you know, astonishing things can generate a lot mm -hmm. of public relations. The M&M &M people, you may have noticed, just recently brought back, I believe it's green M&Ms. And this simple return Was after many of, years of oh. absence there was a rumor, and it was just a uh -huh. rumor apparently, that the dye involved in those M&Ms oh, yes. was Lucky poisonous. Uh -huh. Apparently not true. Um, just a hiatus uh -huh. for that color M&M. And when it came back, it turned out that there had been fan clubs, um, <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of people demanding their favorite colored M&Ms. A whole cult had gathered, and most of the people Mm -hmm. sections, the view sections across America did profiles on the green M&M &M when it returned. That's <laughs> terrific public relations. It's, it's fun. Um, I myself was on a campaign for pet therapy. One of our clients, Sandoz mm -hmm. Pharmaceuticals, has created a mascot, Jeff the dog, who represents pet therapy. You give a pet to an old person uh -huh. and um, apparently if the old person is suffering from Alzheimer's or a stroke, the mm -hmm. source of unconditional love is a major aspect in the therapy. Jeff the dog is a lovely dog and we'd read about a dog named Mandy in Pasadena Hospital. Mm -hmm. Mandy had died, was replaced by Chelsea. We brought Jeff and Chelsea together. Um, the press were there, some Alzheimer's patients were there. Mm -hmm. We sent Chelsea the dog an Easter bouquet from Jeff the dog. <laughs> Chelsea <laughs> stayed up all night making a banner saying, Welcome Jeff, with uh -huh. paw prints all over it. And we had you know, a wonderful, a strange, a somewhat surrealistic press event <laughs> when these dogs who work with the elderly met. I adored it. It was like staging a mad tea party. It really you know, gave me great pleasure. <laughs> and oddly enough, uh -huh. when you put the camera on an old person's face who's stroking the dog, slowly their face opened up. There was, uh -huh. you know, this return of, you know, human plasticity and you could see it. It was happening in front of you. So much so that the um, news person, Doris Winkler, who was there for Channel 13, mm -hmm. said a sentence that I think only Margaret Dumont could have said. <laughs> uh, she said, I have spent a spiritual afternoon with the magic of people and the magic of animals. <laughs> now, I was very moved. If you're me, when you hear the phrase, the magic of animals, uh -huh. I thought, gee, I should get Jeff a wizard's cap and a wand you know, <laughs> for, for the next time we do this kind of thing. Uh -huh. But that's the kind of thing you do. And because the segment was so moving, many people called up to find out about adopting pets. Mm -hmm. Now, let's move this quickly to the area that I care about, which is the arts. Mm -hmm. um, Public relations in the arts is a very interesting subject for me because I care about deeply serious writing in America, mm -hmm. dance, art. Why should all sorts of less valuable forms be winning attention in the press and the media 
when the arts languish in need of budgets and government funds. Mm -hmm. This is very important that we have a government that supports the arts, but it's more important that we have a culture that supports the arts. Do I, we? I, it needs to be created. I think it is there, but very embryonically. When this is like this goes in towards your field now, doesn't it? That's the sense. kind of thing I'm interested in doing mm -hmm. in helping the arts reach their audience and making that audience aware that like well, like an addiction to drugs, there are those of us who are art addicts, mm -hmm. whose lives are changed by the presence of the brilliant people who make new things, mm -hmm. new forms, new forms of culture. I would love to be representing the most interesting actors. We were talking about Crispin Glover before. Mm -hmm. I think that he's an actor who's, who's in, doing... Who's uh, star of uh, River's Edge. He's a star Edge of River's Edge, right. and he was in Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. I think he's an astonishing actor, a kind mm -hmm. of new James Dean, with an acting method all his own. Mm -hmm. and hysterical and frantic, very original. He's very strange. I'm concerned that he could be chewed up by mm -hmm. the media's appetite for new members of the Brat Pack mm -hmm. who disappear, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's a genuine, um, and I would like people to be aware of what he thinks about. Apparently, he lives in a room with no other furniture but wheelchairs. It's all black, too. It's like black. black. Everything's black on black and inside. he writes poetry uh -huh. and, you know, Matt, cares about Matt, things. Can I more tea? Oh, I, I couldn't live without more tea. I was going to offer you the host. Can I offer you more tea? Okay, go ahead. Um, you started ruining the premise of the show. Oh, please. No, no, please. Michael, please do it. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So have you been to his apartment? No, I have not. Um... I'm just using him as an example of the kind of person. His performance has been controversial. Some people have made fun of it. Some people just say, well, he's playing the speed freak. Other people call it operatic and excessive. I thought it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Hadn't seen an actor doing that kind of thing. Many people have learned how to respond mm -hmm. to the anti-acting of Harry Dean Smith or Dennis Hopper. Mm -hmm. This is sort of the opposite pole. Mm -hmm kind of hysteria. You know, it's so great because all the other actors in the uh, film were like so natural. Mm -hmm. You know, very natural and very, you know, great. It was great. Everybody was great in it. But him just doing that over-the-top performance just brings that whole film into another realm of, you know. It created a whole uh -huh. spectrum of yeah, textures of performance. And I thought, you know, that while I thought the film had more problems than successes, mm -hmm. I thought that he was fascinating and the range of performance in it mm -hmm. was quite, quite impressive. Mm -hmm. um, I do this stuff, public relations, because I enjoy it, mm -hmm. because it's sort of mysterious and wonderful, but more than that, I do it because I would like to create a world in the arts both the high arts and the popular arts mm -hmm. that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. I would like to be part of the creation of art, whether it's movies and TV mm -hmm. or opera and dance, of art that my friends and I can love and enjoy. We're Americans and we want our opinions expressed. Expressed too. What, art, what, what uh, type of art do you feel is sort of underappreciated in, in America? I think. In the world? I think, in general, there's an unhappy state that doesn't let popular art be experimental art. Mm -hmm. People feel very nervous mm -hmm. when they see Godard's films with their nervous rhythms. It's as if no one told people, mm -hmm. this is funny, mm -hmm. so no one knew it was funny. Mm -hmm. um, in a certain way, we have all sorts of um, experimental film, but it usually goes under another heading. Mm. Sometimes we'll have comedy that's really surrealism. Mm -hmm. After all, America gave us Buster Keaton. and The, uh, the um, ultimate surrealist. The ultimate surrealist, mm -hmm. and the man who in Sherlock Jr. started entering the films he was projecting. And, and, and actually inspired him well a great deal in his early, in his early films. We're, we're a culture that, you know, makes strange stuff by the ton. Go down mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and look around the art scene and see how many astonishing things you find around you every day. Mm -hmm. You know, the inventions that go on in American art are beautiful, hilarious, moving, and the idea that these things are not known by America's people and that sometimes the artists participate in a conspiracy of silence. We are all of us, if we choose to be artists, somewhat rebellious mm -hmm. against what? Our parents, against the idea that people don't want to know and will never understand us. Mm -hmm. And so we back off. Mm -hmm. But I think with the return of figuration in painting, for instance, and the pop culture comic book imagery mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. taking over many art galleries, that we're making things that are amusing, delighting, mm -hmm. and that you know, the idea that the arts are only for the secret initiates mm -hmm. should be an idea that vanishes. I think that, you know, an art conscious public mm -hmm. will want better movies, will want better television. I think that a talk show like yours doesn't need to be on a cable network. I, I think that if you're talking to Philip Glass, mm -hmm. this is a subject, Glass's music, of great interest, mm -hmm. you know, not only because his music is starting to surface in films that people mm -hmm. happen to see, but because he's dealing with that subject of repetition, which is mm -hmm. the essence of television. In a certain way, I suspect we would not have Philip Glass music if we didn't have sitcoms, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in which the same thing happens over and over uh -huh. and over again. Uh -huh. We've come very sensitive, inadvertently, to repetition with slight variation. Um, that's, that's an interesting point, because a lot of people complain about, say, like the minimalism or the repetition of some, uh, repetition of some sounds, yet uh, your regular lifestyle is a repetition. You know, like the same hour you eat dinner, uh, uh, you go to the same clubs of the weekend. I mean, I know people go to the same places every weekend. And I think I would, uh, that would drive me mad, yet you know, hearing like Phil Glass or something would drive them mad. It's just, it's just a very strange Los Angeles allegory. has an astonishing underground world mm -hmm. of writers and painters and performance artists whose work is amazing. And yet, it's sort of taken that the person has to go like Spalding Gray to New York, come up through the off-Broadway mm -hmm. theater world, go through all sorts of subterfuges, eventually have his work published in two paperback books, then have a movie made before anyone realizes it, that it's very available and enjoyable. The same process now is going on with Eric Bogosian. Um, I think that there are many artists here whose work has always struck us as being hilarious. Yes. Um, but why is that? Why does somebody like Spalding Gray have to go to New York and go for that whole process before people in the West Coast or Los Angeles um, picks up on it. Well, again, sense. the Cognoscenti always knew, and he's been here before. I think, simply, that it's the faulty publicity network. Uh -huh. I think that some very popular writers come and give readings, for instance, in LA, and no one shows up because as good as the Weekly and the Reader are, mm -hmm. they haven't let the they haven't created themselves as the place that people go to find out n mm -hmm. not just what's happening, but what it is as well. They're, they list the thing, but they don't say what it is. There's not an evaluative, evaluative sense going on in those magazines. Um, they do have film critics, but by and large, with so much theater going on here, people have said, that Los Angeles surpassed New York as a place for interesting theater like several beef, years ago. I have a beef about that. For instance, like the film, um, it seems like this, uh, historically, like critics now just don't deal with the, uh, the uh, either the, uh, the new American cinema or underground cinema at all. And the times, like for instance, I don't know who the critic was, but was, I think it was somebody in the reader. Yeah, it was somebody in the reader who just sort of knocked Kenneth Anger's work. Just basically because it's underground cinema and he just didn't want to deal with it, you know? I mean, why do you have to separate, like, Frank Capra's work and Kenneth Anger's work? When I was a boy in New York, when the Village Voice started getting its real sway, mm -hmm. it was getting its real sway because it was reporting on Off-Broadway, which was turning into a scene. Off and off Off-Broadway was where astonishing things were happening. Now, I've said this before, 
and I'll say it again, I think that spirituality is the off-off Broadway of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I think that the channelings that go on here and many of the group spiritual meetings are our version of off-off Broadway. It's a mm -hmm. kind of theater <laughs> of the mind. That people, and people look at you, you know, as if you were describing the work of Merce Cunningham in the 60s. When I tell people about what goes on at, say, Lazarus session, mm -hmm. they look at me as if I were crazy, and that's the same look that one got when one was trying to describe John Cage and Merce Cunningham and what they were doing with silence off-Broadway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now, that we don't acknowledge that we have indigenous art forms is shameful. Mm -hmm. But we need a journalism that's going to do more than just list things. We need there to be critics, and I would even say publicists, who understand the nature of avant-garde and slightly more private, interesting mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are astonishing things that happen all over Los Angeles every week, the Rock for AIDS concert downtown, mm -hmm. things that are theater events all in themselves. I'm thinking of David Abbott's astonishing play, Sonata for Rambeau, that the LA Times critic did not get the point of. I mean, a genuinely brilliant play mm -hmm. um, that when reviewed, he might have been looking at something that the Three Stooges had prepared for consumption. I think a good publicist this is embarrassing to say, would have, in his release, mm -hmm. given the, thea the theater critic enough of a cue to know what he was looking at. The fact that we have John Stepling, whose work is starting to be appreciated, he did the screenplay for 52 Pickup, mm -hmm. writing plays here that are plays of major import. Last year he had Dream Coast that lasted only two weeks at the tape or two because the publicity system mm -hmm. here is so peculiar and doesn't let people know when valuable work is going on. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we know what we always know. We know who's on The Tonight Show. We know to go to the comedy store. We know when a band has gotten its major contract, but how often do we see that band when it's up and coming? Mm -hmm. I think that there are astonishing actresses, Linda Pearl, for instance, who is known for her work on television, but when you put her in the Stoppard play downtown, she's absolutely stunning, mm -hmm. and she wins the um, Drama Log Award, mm -hmm. may still never be known to LA theater goers because no one is out there writing about the moment-by-moment -moment phenomena of the theater. Now, whose fault? Is that like a critic's fault, or is that the newspaper? Is this sort of the... The way the newspapers are structured are as if they do not have to discover the news. They're not, you know, creating mm -hmm. an idiosyncratic personal sense of what's going on. Rather, it's that trend thing. Mm -hmm. You know, here's another play that talks about teenage fathers seeing dentists, you know. Uh -huh. uh, anything. Yeah, I've been hearing about that, too. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of It's just shy. They should stay away from dentists <laughs> for as long as possible after the birth of the first child. Um, <laughs> but. I think that a good arts community generates and eventually demands mm -hmm. strong critics and eventually creates a network that informs. I want this city to be what it de facto already is. Mm -hmm. When we have two art museums opening of the caliber of MOCA and mm -hmm. the new wing of the LA County Museum and a play presented by Peter Sellers, like Zangizi, that great Russian play. Mm -hmm. And then we get Sullivan at the LA Times reviewing it with no sense of the history of the context of theater out of which this great work of the mm -hmm. avant-garde emerged, because it doesn't have the transparency and availability of a Neil Simon play. This was not the job of the actors and the directors. Yes. It was the job of the critic to do some learning before he even arrived at the theater. Mm -hmm. Because great art teaches us and we have to be up to its mark. Mm -hmm. This is a very important thing that not many people in a pop cultural context want to acknowledge. That if you don't demand an educated audience, eventually all that audience is going to want and all they are going to get mm -hmm. is John Hughes. 
Not to say that the Breakfast Club, which I rather liked, mm -hmm. should and not be it. made. <laughs> you, you hated it. I, 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 when I went to see it, I was uh -huh. moved by it. And there was a moment when Ali Sheedy used her dandruff to become snow on an alpine village that she'd draw <laughs> in her notebook that I thought was very charming. Uh -huh. um, but I think it's very, um, it's very important for e even uh, something like this, your mm -hmm. show, to be um, the subject of more than just mm -hmm. um, underground interest. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, the incredible things that go on at Beyond Baroque by now several times a week mm -hmm. um, need to be welcomed and mm -hmm. congratulated for being a part of the LA community. These are people who by and large have fought to mm -hmm. exist and who have a reading series that by now includes people like Raymond Carver and Tess Gallagher. Mm -hmm. Anne Beattie has read there, national and local figures of great distinction, and still Beyond Baroque is fighting for its existence with grants. Well, we're going to have to go, Michael. And uh, I think uh, the city better toughen up, or we're going to take care of it, aren't we? So, the, the two untouchables. It's been a great pleasure to have tea with you, Tosh. Thank you very much. So, toughen up, America. <laughs> we're both in town now. And I'll see you later, uh, very soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.